Welcome back to Flakes Ice Geos, everyone. Ryan here, and on this episode of The Tone Engineer, we are tearing down the walls between genres without completely destroying your wallet with an affordable stereo cover rig. So to quickly recap what I try to accomplish with this video series, in between the band and often album specific episodes where we try to nail one kind of tone with hardware, VST plugins, amp modelers, you name it, I try to sprinkle in these videos where we take kind of a palette of sounds generally through one genre where the rig itself is very adaptable. It's not like there's one country sound or one hard rock sound. Um, and show kind of what the general signal path would look like, talk about what kind of gear you can drop in, drop out. And it's similar today, except we're gonna to try to cram as many genres as possible into one rig. And this is kind of like your Friday, Saturday night cover band or you know playing with friends when you're in high school and college and don't have but a few dollars to your name. And actually my main rig as a teenager didn't look all that different from this, except I ran more stuff in front. My pedal board was a lot bigger than uh, we'll be using today. But I think this serves as a, a pretty good platform because let's face it, just by looking at this, you know as well as I do, you're not getting the utmost best studio quality sounds out of this, but no one's really gonna care if, uh, you're playing the kind of venues where this would make sense. This is gonna be close enough and the crowd pleasing songs, they're not gonna demand so much out of this kind of setup that you can't get a, a good enough sound. Um, but you know, Jimi Hendrix, Zeppelin, as well as pop rock, dad rock, contemporary country, whatever people are going to bars to listen to, you know, this thing isn't gonna make you sound like Mashuga, but at the same time, you're probably not going to be opening up a classic rock set with that or Cannibal Corpse in the first place, so it's not what this is meant to do. So for an overall signal path, we'll be starting with a fairly capable electric guitar in terms of tonal options. This has a five-way switch with two humbuckers and a single coil in the center, so you know a pretty big spectrum of tones coming out of this. We'll be going into a preamp processor, which will be doing all the heavy lifting when it comes to tones. So we're talking post effects like chorus flanger, delay, reverb, compressors, as well as your main amp sounds. Multiple preamp sounds is definitely the secret sauce that allows a rig to successfully cover a wide gamut of tones. And this thing has a few quality of life features as well, like a built-in tuner, some drive boost distortion capabilities, things we'll get in, into a moment. We'll be running that into a stereo power section, which in and of itself is within a combo amplifier. And that amp, of course, will be equipped with two independent 12 inch speakers. Everything else from that point on is really up to you. And the way that I'll be handling it is just trying to fill in the gaps of what this rig doesn't do so well. So if you know you got like a preamp processor that you don't really like the chorus sound, then maybe you want to throw a chorus pedal in there, or you want to have a specific delay for a couple songs, maybe you get another delay pedal. Or in my case, I want to have an overdrive. You can throw that in there. Um, just all these things will, you know, kind of add up to number one, more money. Number two, more of a pedal dance if you don't throw even more cash at something like a pedal looper, MIDI controller of that sort. But for looking in this budget range, that's probably not happening. So I guess to formally introduce all the gear I'll be using today, I am once again whoring out my Ibanez RG350DX for a couple reasons. Number one, this thing was extremely cheap. Even with a pickup upgrade, I spent a little under $200 on this whole package. And I think that's a good price range if you need a guitar, I know a lot of you that'll be watching this video will already have that covered, so this will slash your budget even further. Um, but I like kind of the 200 or 250 used range because you can find a lot of guitars that new would be 400 to 450, and I think that's where it starts to get serious 
where you're not looking at the same like black strat knockoff that isn't going to be good, but for a couple genres and generally the setup is awful and all those things. So for, you know, come a couple hundred dollars and some change, you can get something and, you know, pay for a setup and some uh, other fine tweaking and make it a real player. And hopefully it won't look completely awful either, but that will, uh, of course, be subjective to you. Depending on your set list and your own playing needs, you can, of course, choose any guitar or pickup configuration under the sun. I decided to go with this, though, because of the five-way switch with an HSH configuration. So this gives you a bridge humbucker, it gives you a neck humbucker, a single coil middle, and then split coil and middle combinations on both the bridge and the neck. And I think this particular combo is like the be all end all for a cover band personally. Um, if this had dedicated coil taps on the neck and the bridge as well, which you could wire in with another switch or um, you know, like mini toggles or something like that, then you'd really be able to cover about everything. I find the 25 and a half inch um, scale works with basically any genre, even if you have to like drop tune this to D. Um, or you know completely go down to D standard then you're not you know completely in trouble you do have the floating bridge to mess with on this guitar which I actually like because you have fine tuning options back here um, and before more of you comment I'm very well aware the angle on this bridge is fucked up I didn't set it up that way I currently have Ernie Ball super slinkies on this and that is obviously not what was used before on this guitar so I'm not going to mess with it till I put some heftier strings um, so there is something to be said for fixed bridges and string throughs and all that if you're looking for low maintenance but when it comes to the tones the playability I really like this guitar not to mention the pickup upgrade which if you watch that video you can check that out here then you'll know this has some microphonic feedback problems, but kind of expected when you spend $60 on a full set. Either way, I like the tones. I like how they simultaneously sound full and cutting in both clean and high gain applications. And hopefully if you spend around this $200 on just the guitar itself, and like I did, or maybe just a touch more, you'll have stock pickups that you don't really feel the need to change out. And to be completely honest, if I was just gonna put it through this rig, I wouldn't have done it anyway. <laughs> Let's skip over the effects section for now and talk about the amplifier. This is my Marshall MG 250 DFX. And if you've been around the channel a time or two, you'll probably know I don't exactly have the strongest feelings for this amplifier. It has its problems both in the clean and overdrive sections of the preamp. It does some cool things though. Number one, it is stereo, which is kind of the whole point of this video, um, meaning that you have independent speakers. So it's not 250 watts, it's two times 50 watt power amps. And with that comes a stereo effects loop. There's a mono send and then you get stereo effects returns, which is super powerful. More on that in a moment. You also get some cool digital post effects, which I won't be taking advantage of today because they're kind of useless for real time application because you can't change reverb on the fly. There's no foot switch for that. And you can only use one effects at a time. And you got a couple presets that you can, you know, turn on and off, which is, you know, that's good. But if you want to switch between, say, a flanger and a delay alone, you can't do that without manually dialing in. So I'm just skipping over that entirely. There's this frequency dampening thing, which is like a loudness button, not using that crap. And there is a emulated line out, which personally I don't like when it's used with this amplifier, but it actually is, you know, it, it's functional. And I think it would work in a pinch if you don't have microphones on hand to, you know, kind of mic up the speaker cabinet. So if you have a TRS cable handy, you could just send that to a mixed desk, maybe put a little post EQ on it and you'll get a functional sound over loudspeakers. I just really don't like the experience playing through that output through headphones. A similar limitation is the speaker choice, which is something you should expect when you're paying $500 brand new for an amplifier, combo amplifier, or like less than 200 views that these are going for now, unless you're Harley Bitten. I don't know how they managed to throw V30s in a speaker cab, but whatever, it's a topic for another video. Um, but with this, I, I never found the speakers to be a good match to the sound. Again, not surprising, but if you mic them up and you put a decent preamp sound through it, it actually works. And so everything you'll be hearing in this video 
will be mic'd up with an independent SM57 on the left channel and an SM7B on the right channel. They'll both be kind of at a 45 degree, not quite exactly in the middle of the cone, but you know, around that region and a lot of tweaking just to get them to kind of EQ out evenly. So you could throw a bottom of a barrel microphone up to this and it actually reacts decently. For the preamp channels, it actually doesn't matter whatsoever because we're not using them. Hence why there's no cable going into the input section, though there's not a cable going anywhere right now, but that minor details, worry about that in a minute. What that means for you though, is anything that resembles this, whether it be a stereo combo amp with effects returns that are also stereo, or two mono amp rigs, both of which have an effects return going to a one by 12 cabinet, will achieve the same thing. And there's actually something to be said for the advantages of having two mono rigs instead of one stereo combo amp. Um, number one, weight. So this thing, you know, it's kind of a behemoth. It's light as far as a combo amp goes, but still takes up a lot of room. If you're gigging out of a car, this thing's a pain in the ass to move around. Um, you know, if you've got two mono amps, mono cabinets, you can kind of stack and pack them. It's not as bad on your back. Uh, number two, I think, more importantly, is if you're the only guitarist in your jam group, then you can get a bigger stereo space. So you can set one cab on stage left, one cab on stage right, and everyone will be able to hear it. And when you do delays and choruses and all these things, um, it, it sounds bigger, it sounds fuller because there's a, a larger stereo image. So, you know, if you can find one by 12 solid state power amps like that, um, then it would definitely be something worth looking into. Or say you have a really transparent tube amp that does the same thing. You're running into higher cost territory at that point. But I think realistically, you can find for, you know, $115, $120 a piece, a couple one by 12s with effects returns this day and age. And as I showed on a recent power amp shootout, the power section of this amp is actually really respectable. When you put a genuine tube preamp and the effects return and send the speaker outs to a you know real four x 12 cabinet, it's really hard to tell the difference at first between that and a real tube power amp until it gets to break up territory. So for gigging volumes, for recording volumes, you're really good with a class AB solid state power amp. The main thing you'll have to worry about is will it get loud enough? So in that budget territory, 50 watts will probably be fine, but you know, you'll be competing with drums and bass guitar and you know, a louder PA, which is why I think some of this direct out and micing this up is, is a good idea. But um, generally 50 watts will be right in the sweet spot for solid state stuff. That brings us to the workhorse of today's video, the Hein 6 Pod 2.0, the amp modeler everyone loves to hate. And as I showed in a couple videos so far, and we have one more shootout planned using this piece of equipment, it actually doesn't sound bad when used in certain applications. And I think today's application lets it shine through. The biggest hangups I've had with the pod series I've reviewed so far, and I have a feeling it will continue, is that the cab modeling is just atrocious. Uh, it, it doesn't sound real. Uh, there's a couple of reasons for that. Number one, there's no power section modeling in anything up until pod HD, which means it's just like putting a preamp VST straight through an impulse response. Compound that with the fact that none of the cab models on this thing really sound all that great. They're extremely fizzy, but boxy, yet there's no high frequency content. You have to use a ton of post EQ to make them to work, at least on like the XT and up, you can choose between a few different mics per cab. You still can't blend microphones. Um, but you know, put all that together and you've got something that people aren't all that impressed with in direct applications, at least when you compare it by modern day standards. However, if you bypass the cabinet modeling and you use this as just a preamp, because that's, that's what it does. Again, there's no power amp modeling like you would see on, um, a Kemper or an Axe FX or what have you. And you put it through a real cabinet section, you put it through a real power amp, then it, it kind of works, um, which I don't think it should be a huge shock to people. That's how a lot of uh, professionals toured with you know these kind of devices. And that gives you a myriad of amplifier and effect sounds at your fingertips, as well as MIDI capability. So you can you know change through presets remotely or dial in settings through your Mac or PC. The sound driver software still works, which is pretty cool. And uh, that's how I finalized all my settings. So you can do things like turn on a chorus, delay, and compressor at the same time, which you can't do from the front face here. 
You can activate like a clean drive boost, which will throw a little bit more dirt in front and make it a little bit more of that tube screamer sound, even though this doesn't have stomp box modeling. There's also like a distortion, a present, a presence boost, a few other things that aren't here. So if you're really trying to scrutinize it, you can do it that way. And you get all that for like, there's, they're going for 60 to 80 bucks. It's, it's insanely cheap. Um, there are a couple downsides of that. First of all, the original pod in 2.0 is going for a price that is comparable to the following generation, the XT. And that includes like 64 presets of effects. Of course, you can add your own. Um, a, a lot of different models in terms of amplifiers and effects. It adds stop box modeling. So if you want a fuzz or a tube screamer or a compressor up front, you'll, you'll have to buy another pedal to actually use it with the 2.0. Personally speaking, I'm not a huge fan of the stock amp models on the XT. I think a lot of the, the ones in the vintage and metal pack sound pretty respectable. Um, but they changed the rectifier sound. They changed all sorts of stuff that I don't like the XT at stock as is. I really like the X3 as we'll talk about later. Um, but I think this one's more fun. Like I, I just like the 2.0 to tell you the truth. It's not like authentic. You can't put this next to a real rectifier and go, oh yeah, that sounds identical. Um, this is like to me having a collection of stomp boxes that try to sound like the amplifier, but uh, it's like not the same league, but it's, it's almost not trying to be, you know, at the time they were like, oh, this will replace everything you'll ever have in your studio. But, you know, at this point, it's just like, no, nah, it's just a collection of, of fun sounds, I think. Another disadvantage is because I chose the desktop version, you'd have to shell out a few more dollars for a foot controller of some sort, whether it be the four button switch or the long board with a couple expression pedals where you could use the volume swells and the wah pedals and all that stuff. Or the smarter thing would probably just be to buy the floor pod and edit it from there, um, especially if all you're going to do is play with this live and practice with. That's, you know, kind of makes way more sense in my opinion. But, you know, for what this is going for, in that $100 or less region, it's really crazy the capability you can get, um, even out of older equipment, if you know how to work with it. And I think this is like the, the best case scenario for it, is putting it through something that actually moves air, something that's actually, you know, putting some power behind it. I think that's where you, you get a, a more instilled sense of authenticity versus just the direct tones. As you might imagine, I'm taking advantage of the presets and banks built into the pod. So you won't be seeing really any controls changing. You'll just see the number and, and letter depending on the preset and bank. Um, but I will show the settings that I made through the ancient sound driver program, but you'll get the idea. And if you're wondering why I've been saying pod 2.0, this is actually the pod 2.3. It's just in a original um, pod chassis. So the, the firmware is 2.3 firmware. This will sound like the pod 2.0, the pod pro, as well as the pocket pod, I presume, since it's based on uh, 2.0 architecture as well.
The cherry on top of my rig is the Boss Super Overdrive, and this is entirely for pushing high gain sounds over the top within the Pod 2.0. Again, this doesn't have stomp box modeling. It does have a drive boost and distortion boost, but it doesn't do the same kind of EQ thing. It doesn't do the band pass around you know, 700 to 1000 hertz like the Tube Screamer or Super Overdrive does, and I prefer the sound for this. Um, from this for high gain sound specifically. So the way I've got it dialed in right now is not quite the way I normally would. I've got drive at about nine o'clock level between one and two and tone at about one o'clock. And what this does is makes a really good heavy metal boost. So you could throw this in front of like the JCM 800 models. Or what I really like with this is you can do a cool clean roll off type of thing. So let's say on the neck pickup, you're doing kind of a clean sound. You've got master volume on your guitar, and you know between four to five, whatever. And you're on kind of a crunchy amp, not really high gain, but just enough maybe like um, a Vox AC30 or one of these maybe Brit Blues Breaker or something like that. And you get kind of a, a breakup sound. It's clean enough, but there's just a little grit on the end. And then you could switch to your bridge, turn up volume all the way up turn the overdrive on and you're on a respectable high gain tone. So that's a pretty cool way to not have to even change parameters on the pod and, and get multiple different sounds. It's you know something people, a lot of people do with lower gain amplifiers. The disadvantage on this guitar is because there's only one volume, uh, it's harder to do that in real time. If you have like a Gibson type guitar, you could just set the volume on the neck at a certain spot at all times and switch to a wide open uh, bridge pickup. But I'll show you that you'll at least hear it. And that's pretty much it. I mean, you could add whatever you want. I could have put an EQ pedal there instead. You could put a phaser up front. Whatever you do is just gonna be more tap dancing. Just remember that. So if you tally up all the numbers, we're looking at a grand total of between $450 to $500 for everything you see here, depending on you know how good you're able to negotiate and the market prices at that time. And of course, you might upgrade one thing or downgrade another thing, so your mileage may vary. But considering you get everything plus a guitar for what this amplifier is going for new, I think it's pretty damn respectable, especially for the sounds you get out of it. Um, and again, a lot of you are either gonna have pieces of this already or something equivalent. You might even already have a guitar that'll work for you. So for the price of a decent microphone or a, a boutique pedal or maybe less, you can have everything. That's, that's pretty crazy considering um, you know, how many people chase after these little character tones. When you can get a, a lot of that out of really affordable stuff nowadays, not to say there's not a reason for that. I'm guilty of it as well, but you know, having a rig like this is kind of awesome for me because number one, it's all digital or solid state, so you don't have to worry about putting hours on tubes, but it, it just kind of lets me disconnect from all the, the other stuff, all the work I do on this channel and just plug in and have fun. It, it, it's kind of a nostalgia trip for me anyway, where it reminds me of the, the sounds that I was trying to get when I was just starting out playing guitar. So if nothing else, I think this was a fun little junkyard build of a guitar rig. If you have any questions, comments, as always, please leave them down below and we will see you on the next Tone Engineer. Thanks for watching. Bye.